Well, hello, class. Welcome back to Child Development. This is Chapter 2, Prenatal Development. I am your professor, Professor Bryn. Welcome back. Last week, I asked you to have your mom or a caregiver or someone special in your life provide for you a baby picture of yourself. So I hope that you have this baby picture with you just sitting right next to you. And look at yourself. Aren't you adorable? That's you. <laughs> That's you when you're a baby. So we're going to walk through essentially what gets you to that spot. So this chapter is going to cover prenatal development. We're going to talk about the biological basis of development and your biological and psychological beginnings. There's a lot to cover, so we'll talk about essentially the period from conception to birth. But I also hope at the end of this lecture, I want to talk a little bit about the birthing process and labor and delivery. So for those of you that will be moms and those of you that will be dads and those of you that will be caregivers and family members and important people in kids' lives in the future, you know a little bit more today than you did before about the process. The process of pregnancy, the process of labor and delivery, and this amazing process of your life from conception to birth. So since this chapter is focused on the biological beginnings of human life, we need to talk a little bit about the biology of what makes you, you. This chapter covers prenatal development and we see that prenatal development is highly influenced by the inheritance, expression, and regulation of genes. Your chapter begins by walking through an overview of genetic inheritance. And one of the big pieces to that has to do with chromosomes and genes. We know that every person is made up of trillions of cells, each of which contains chromosomes. And those chromosomes are the genetic material that determines many things that make you, you. Your eye color, your skin color, your personality, your intelligence, your adaptability. The cells in your body have chromosomes and those chromosomes are made up of DNA. So your genetic structure are short places on that DNA sequence. We know that's a double helix sequence. And those genes have instructions that code for proteins. And those proteins are the cell building blocks that guide biological processes. From this standpoint, we're thinking and remembering that psychology is the scientific study of human behavior and mental processes. On a very reductionist level and going as small as we can, we are knowing that there is a biological beginning to those human behaviors and mental processes. So as we learn more and more about our biology, we learn more and more about our psychology. So that DNA sequence is responsible for the transmission and activation of genetic material. At the moment of conception, the mother and father's DNA essentially are passed on in such a way as they're combined uniquely. With the exception of a few rare circumstances, a human being has 23 paired chromosomes. So the developing zygote, which is the sperm and egg meeting, they get half of the chromosomes from one parent and half from the other parent. The first 22 pairs are autosomes and they determine stuff like eye color, hair color, and physical characteristics. And the last pair, known as the sex chromosomes, determine a person's biological sex. Females will have two X chromosomes, and males will have an X and a Y chromosome. So genetic expression is carefully regulated in every organism to allow that organism to adapt to differing conditions. The expression of genetic information in a given cell or organism is neither random nor fully pre-programmed. So genes can either be dominant or recessive, meaning they can either be expressed or hidden. Depending on the dominance of each chromosomal piece or DNA sequence that is inherited from each parent, the child may or may not show that inherited trait. Differences in gene expression are crucial to an individual's physical and psychological development. And we know from our discussion of the nature versus nurture issue from the last chapter that whether things are biologically pre-programmed or whether nurture helps develop those things 
is at the heart of developmental psychology. But make no mistake, your genetic makeup serves as a crucial baseline for our characteristics psychologically and physically to begin to develop. But when it comes to genetic expression, we know that the nature, the nature of genetics, your biological basis, it's not the entire story. Your nurture or environment mediates and influences genetic expression. We're going to talk a little bit later in this chapter about the impact of environment and substances on prenatal development. Your mother's stress level and your mother's nutrition and your father's smoking or not smoking during pregnancy, it mattered for your physical development. Now your biology is pretty awesome and pretty rugged and, and pretty able to sustain and continue. But we do know that the environment absolutely has an influence on prenatal development and later development as well. So one of the things that we know is that genetic expression is complicated and you are quite biologically complicated. The Human Genome Project was an international effort, a research program, and the goal was to map the entire genome, the entire gene sequences of human beings. And their mapping revealed around 20,000 genes. Those are unique pieces and sequences of DNA. An interesting finding from that is that there are more proteins than there are genes. So there's not a one-to-one -one gene to protein expression. Genes do multiple things. And this is important to note because we know that genes are essentially highly collaborative with other genes. We call this polygenic. That means that the expression of a trait or characteristic is determined by the interaction of many different genes. And those genes are not just interactive with themselves, they're also responsive to internal and external environments. So when we're talking about the internal environment, we're talking about hormones and proteins and enzymes and biological processes, cortisol, oxytocin, estrogen, stuff that is moving through the body. And when we're talking about environmental influences, we're talking about radiation, light, sleep, stress levels, nutrition, exercise, temperature of the world around you, things that are in the environment. So genes can have influence upon other genes. That's a gene to gene interaction. Genes can have an influence because they're being influenced by an internal environment difference. So there's a hormone level, there's something in the biology of a person that is making the gene either turn on or off, meaning code for proteins or not. Or a gene could be activated or suppressed by an external environment setting, such that maybe I have the gene for a particular characteristic, but it only flourishes in an environment that is safe with good nutrition and good sleep and low stress levels. This idea of polygenic inheritance is important as we understand that these genes interact with one another and they also interact with the environment around them. So let's walk this back just to the gene to gene interaction level for a second. Not even contending with external or internal environment differences. Your genes interact with one another. We know from the Human Genome Project that there's around 20,000 gene sequences that you have. So this is a lot of interactions that could take place. And within the biological basis of who you are, your genes interact with one another to determine whether something is expressed or displayed. When something is displayed, we call that a phenotype. So whether or not something is in your phenotype expressed, so something like skin color, is going to be determined by the interaction and collaboration of multiple genes. When I'm thinking of gene-to-gene -gene expression, I, I have a kind of simple example that I want to share with you, and I hope that it helps a little bit. Because we tend to think of genes as being on or off. They're either coding for proteins or not. So I want to give you a metaphor and sort of explain gene-to-gene -gene interactions 
and hopefully it'll help you a little bit. Even though it's a little simplistic, this is how my brain understands gene-to-gene -gene collaboration. Okay, so I want you to walk into my house with me. I have a two-story house, and when you walk into my house, you immediately see the stairway, and you see the upstairs level, and there are two lights that are lighting up essentially both stories. There's one that's lower and there's one that's higher. The purpose of the light, of course, is so that I don't trip up the stairs or fall down the stairs, right? So it's lighting up both levels. So there are two lights. They are controlled together. When one turns on, the other turns on. But there are three separate locations in my house that can turn the light on or off. So you have an upstairs bedroom that right when you step out, you can turn the light switch on there so you don't trip down the hallway. Farther down the hallway near the entrance of the stairway, there's also another light switch so that if you were to exit another bedroom, you could turn the light on and not fall down the stairs. And right when you walk in the house, there's a light switch that is on the lower floor that turns them on or off from the lower story. Two lights, three different places, of an on or off switch. Well, let's imagine that those three light switches are genes. Now, since these three light switches together determine whether the lights are on or off, each individual light switch, it's not really keyed to up means on and down means off. Like for example, right now I just looked out in the hallway because I'm recording in the second in the second story. So I looked out the hallway and the hallway lights are off because it's daytime when I'm doing this. The two upstairs hallway lights are in the upward position. They're, they're facing up right now. But the downstairs light, which was the last one that I sort of acted on, it's in the lower position and it turned the lights off. So here I've got three genes. Two of them are quote unquote on, they're in the upward position. And one of the genes is in the off position and the lights are off. It's the influence of the three light switches that determines whether the gene is expressed or not. They work together to determine whether the lights are on or off. Now that might be kind of confusing because we like to think of light switches as if they're up, if they're facing up, that's on, and if they're down, they're off. But if there's multiple light switches and they're acting together to determine an outcome or a circuit, in this case, electrical circuit for two lights, then this is an example of polygenic inheritance, multiple genes collaborating and working together to express or not a particular characteristic a particular behavior, a particular thinking pattern, a particular disease, and a particular developmental process. This genetic process is very complicated within itself. So just on the biological level of gene-to-gene -gene interaction, you're very complex. The human system is very complicated. Adding another layer of complexity to this, we have the environment of where you have genetic and environment interactions. So in the epigenetic view, your development is the result of an ongoing bidirectional interchange between nature and nurture, biology and context or situation. What this means on a broader level, of course, is that nature and nurture together create the person that you are. You might not be able to change your genes but through environment, you could change your gene expression. So for example, some certain genes for inflammation or depression, they might only turn on or become active under stressful, low sleep circumstances. At the very least, your stress level and your amount of sleep that you're getting affords you some ability to influence the genetic expression of those preset characteristics. And we know that the research shows that people are not getting enough sleep. So if you want to do your body and your mind and your academic and your social and your everything life, if you want to do that a favor, the research shows that you should get some better sleep. I know that that sounds somewhat easy in practice, just sleep more, right? But it's not, it's not like that. It means sleep hygiene.
So how's your sleep? Do you put your screens away as you're about to sleep or are you in bed scrolling through Instagram? So when we're talking about nature and nurture or the epigenetic view or gene environment connections, there's some different ways that genes and environment can interact to display a characteristic. So let's walk through these classifications. One way that your nature and nurture could interact is through a passive genotype environment correlation. Now this is passive because essentially your biological parents often, who are genetically related to you, they've raised you and they've provided a rearing environment for you. So the biological parents provide a rearing environment for the child. The parent in their gene has some traits that are genetically part of who they are that creates and leads to the expression of those traits in the environment. So those traits that are expressed through environmental resources and rearing environments, they provide opportunities for that trait genetically to be expressed in the child. So I have a picture here of myself and my parents. Aren't they adorable? So my dad loves to read. Let's imagine that genetically he just is a reader. He loves to read. So as part of him just being alive, there are books in the environment. The rearing environment has the opportunity for reading. So this is a passive genotype environment correlation because my dad is just being himself. And as he's himself, he's creating an environment that reflects his own genetic inclinations. When you also think about the fact that my dad would read to me more frequently because that's something that he is doing anyway, he's reading a lot, it's more often likely that he would read to me, you see that that genotype or that set point for the parent is creating a rearing environment that creates potentialities and influence for the outcome on the child's behavior. Another type of nature-nurture connection is something called evocative genotype environment correlation. And this happens because a child's traits or genetic characteristics can elicit and evoke certain types of environments. Said another way, a child's traits or genetic inclinations can influence a change upon the environment around them. And from the environment changing around them, we can see evocative changes in the expression of a trait. An active child or a child that loves to play and that's very gregarious and extroverted and outgoing and physically active is more likely going to evoke that active play from their own parents. The child has an influence even on their own rearing environment. So I mentioned in passive genotype as my dad being a reader and creating a rearing environment where books and reading were part of the environment in general and had influence that way. In evocative genotype environment, I am a pretty talkative kid and always have been. My mom's actually pretty shy and you're going to hear it because one of the guest speaker little videos that I've made for you has both of my parents talking so you get to meet them so that's very exciting. But you'll hear that my mom is so much more introverted than my dad. But that being said, as I'm standing with my mom recording this video for you guys and, and you get to hear them talk about parenting and parenting styles later in this class, you'll hear that my own talkativeness and my extroversion can draw out my mom, creating an environment where there's now more discussion and more connection and more back and forth. If you add my dad to the mix there, where you've got now two talkers and then we're influencing my mom to be more talkative, you have an evocative genotype environment correlation. I, in my genes, am prone to be extroverted and as I am more extroverted, I draw out my dad, who's already extroverted, and my mom, who is quiet, but becomes more gregarious and more interactive once I've essentially evoked that from the environment. 
Another way that nature and nurture can connect is through active genotype environment correlations. This goes by another name and that's called niche picking. It's picking a niche. It's picking a spot where that's kind of your place. In this nature nurture connection, kids are actively seeking out, actively going to, actively finding a niche, finding a place that is compatible and stimulating. And that place or that environment is something that is suited to their abilities and to their genotype. And this is active because they're actively choosing it. So in this correlation and this connection between nature and nurture, children are seeking out environments that are stimulating and that are in line with their genetic predisposition. So we have two twins here and they are born on the same day and raised in the same environment. Every day, the same routine, the same parents, the same circumstance. On the left, holding the O for one, <laughs> you see Liam. And on the right, holding the E, you have Lucas. So we have Liam and Lucas. They are twins. They're identical twins. They have the same genetic structure. They've been raised in the same environment. By all accounts, they should be the same in their psychology, their behaviors and mental processes. But you know what? They actually are somewhat different, very different. Liam, for example, is very rough and tumble and very active. He likes to climb things. If he's in a room, he's immediately exploring, immediately grabbing stuff, immediately climbing on stuff, immediately trying to turn light switches on. He has this fascination with the light switch. He can move boxes and toys and car toys and things because he wants to stand on stuff to turn the light switches and the lamps on and off. So Liam is extremely active. Same environment, same parenting. But Lucas is actually very quiet and very tender and very cuddly. He likes to be close to people. If he's in a new room and there's new experiences, his brother immediately starts exploring, but Lucas draws close to the people. So he'll stay close to the couch or close to his mom and, and stay close to her. So despite genetic similarity and environmental similarity, they themselves make decisions about which environments to seek out and which environments to ignore. So let me give you an example. There is a place in town called Kids Play World. And it's a place for kids that are under four years old. So this is like zero to four for moms, caregivers, dads, and their young kids to come and play. Since there's no big kids there, and since the toys are meant for very little kids, it's very safe. So it's, it's a safe place for the littles to play. When Liam and Lucas go with their mom to Kids Play World, they have the same opportunities. They make different decisions. They might have the same genotype. They might have the same environment in general. But they take an active role in choosing play places at this play place, kids play world. So Liam immediately goes to the ball pit, like immediately climbs the net, crawls over the slide, knocks other kids over, and immediately is actively throwing the balls in the ball pit, just immediately doing that. But Lucas, his brother, his identical twin brother, is at a different place in the playland. So this playland has a little quiet zone where there's like bean bags and books to read and finger paints and slime and stuff that he can use with his hands, but he doesn't have to be that far away from his caregiver. That's kind of where the adults sit. The adults are in this area. So Lucas, Lucas goes to a different area in the playland. He goes closer to his caregiver and closer to the quiet, more reflective activities. In this example, we're seeing niche picking. We're seeing kids pick a niche to pick somewhere that is stimulating for what they want to do. And you know, the interesting thing about this, you guys, is the brain at this age is so plastic and so able to grow. And the brain 
at any age, but especially in this in this young age, the brain wires and strengthens to the things that the brain is doing, meaning that the more that Liam climbs, the more that his brain likes climbing, finds it rewarding, and wants to strengthen those connections. And the more that Lucas plays with his hands or plays with Play-Doh or connects with a caregiver, the more those places develop in his brain as well. You use the areas and strengthen the areas that are being used. So despite the fact that Liam and Lucas have the same environment and a same genetic structure baseline, they are wiring and strengthening and diversifying their brain differently by choosing different settings to play in and choosing different ways in which to interact with their environment. I hope I've made a good case for the fact that it's not just your biological inheritance that derives your destiny, that the environment also plays a role in how those genes interact with one another and how they're expressed or not expressed. Your book talks a little bit about susceptibility and longevity genes. Susceptibility genes are essentially genes that make an individual more vulnerable to a specific disease or to a specific health issue. A genetic predisposition is sometimes called genetic susceptibility. It's an increased likelihood of developing a particular disease based on a person's genetic makeup. And that genetic predisposition results from specific genetic variations that are often inherited from your parent or from a parent, at least one parent in the combination. And these might be genes for cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, asthma, depression. These genetic changes contribute to the development of a disease, but they don't directly cause it. So some people with a predisposing susceptibility gene or a genetic variation will never get the disease, while others will, even within the same family. In people with a genetic predisposition or a susceptibility, the risk of disease can depend on multiple factors. Diseases that are caused by a combination of factors are described as multifactorial or polygenic. Although a person's genetic makeup cannot be altered, some lifestyle and environmental modifications may be able to reduce disease risk in people with a susceptibility to a certain disease. Your book talks a little bit about genetic structures and susceptibility for depression. In that depression example, there's a serotonin gene, a particular gene that with stress and like with a stressful environment, they have to be together. The gene has to be there plus the stress has to be there for the phenotype or the expression of depression. So that actual molecular modification of the DNA strand as a result of the stressful environment, that's what changes the gene function, that it has to be the gene plus environment interaction that results in the phenotype, in this case, the expression of depression. So what does this all mean? This means essentially that we have an appreciation for the fact that your genetic structure and your biology, who you are, biologically at a very micro, very reductionist, very small cellular level is influenced by that level. So it's gene to gene, it's nature to nature, but also nature to nurture in such a way as your nature biologically and your nurture context environment matter in regard to the expression of those traits. And the expression of those traits, human behavior and mental processes, that gets us into psychology. There's a quote from a researcher in your textbook that talks about biology allowing a broad range of cultural possibilities. And I think that's a really cool way of encapsulating what we've been talking about. All right, now I wanna switch us into prenatal development and getting down to the conception to birth part of this chapter. Prenatal development is the process of rapid change and growth that occurs in the approximately 40 weeks prior to the birth of a child, from conception to birth. This part of our chapter is gonna talk about the course of prenatal development, some hazards to prenatal development, 
and we'll talk about labor, delivery, and prenatal care. And ultimately, I hope you walk out with a better understanding and appreciation for how cool pregnancy is and how cool the process is. All right, so let's dive in a little bit here. So before we even get into the three different stages of prenatal development, germinal, embryonic, and fetal, and those stages are not the trimesters, they're different stages, but we'll talk about the trimesters too. What we want to note is that conception is the process of a sperm from the male testes and the egg from the ovary of the female meeting and joining their genetic material. We know, thanks to the beginning of this chapter, that all cells in your body, except for the sperm and egg, have 46 chromosomes that are set together in 23 pairs. Those cells, every other cell in your body, reproduces and multiplies by way of cell division or mitosis, where they're basically creating exact replicas of the original cell. Your sperm and egg cells However, they divide by a special process, and that's called meiosis. They're the only cells in your body that divide in a different way than all the other cells in your body. So your sperm and egg cells actually divide twice, and this creates four cells with half of the amount of genetic material, meaning you have 23 unpaired chromosomes. This is important because when the sperm and egg meet by fertilization, they should create one fully paired, 23 paired, 46 chromosome cell. So the sperm and egg, when they combine, create a full 23 pair, 46 chromosome cell, which is a truly unique combination for every combination of sperm and egg. Sometimes in the fertilization process, however, there are chromosomal abnormalities. You see on this slide here some of the different abnormalities that might be possible. So chromosome abnormalities, they can be either numerical or structural. A numerical abnormality means that an individual is either missing one of the chromosomes from a pair or has two of the chromosomes instead of a pair. A structural abnormality means that the chromosome structure, the actual DNA sequence, the genetic sequence has been altered or mutated in some way. That could be via deletion or a duplication error. That could be translocation, meaning that a portion of the chromosome is transferred to the wrong spot in another part of the chromosome. It could be an inversion in the translation process where it should look like a certain sequence in a certain order, but the order has been inverted. The actual gene sequence is in the wrong order. And most chromosome abnormalities occur as an accident in either the egg or the sperm. In these cases, the abnormality is present in every cell of the body. Most chromosome abnormalities occur as an accident in that meiosis process. And that's either in the egg cell or the sperm cell. But some of those abnormalities happen after conception. They happen after fertilization where the sperm and egg meet. Chromosome abnormalities can either be inherited from the parent or they can be new and new to the individual. Two factors that increase the risk of abnormalities of a chromosomal variety are maternal age and some environmental factors. And those two factors, maternal age and environment, continue to be researched. The research on maternal age is a little bit farther ahead than environmental influences. We know that women that are older are more likely to be at risk of delivering and giving birth to children with chromosomal abnormalities. But we also know that very young women as well have some risk factors there as well. And in regard to environmental factors, whether that's radiation or x-ray or cancer risk, we continue to need more and more research on the environmental impact on birth rates, birth risks, and abnormality risks. All right, so let's talk about the course of prenatal development. 
And let's talk about the germinal period, embryonic period, and fetal period. Okay, taking place in the first two weeks after conception, we have the germinal stage. The germinal stage is the stage of development that occurs from conception until two weeks, and that's where implantation takes place. Conception occurs when the sperm fertilizes the egg. Sperm plus egg equal the zygote. A zygote begins as a one cell structure that is created when the sperm and egg merge. So they're merging their chromosomal and genetic material. At the moment of conception, the mother and father's DNA are combined, they're merged. And during the first week after conception, the zygote rapidly divides and multiplies going from a one cell structure to two cells, then four, then eight, and so on. This process of cell division is called mitosis, and mitosis is a relatively fragile process at this point, and fewer than one half of all zygotes survive beyond the first two weeks. After five days of mitosis, there are 100 cells, and after nine months, there are billions of cells. As the cells divide, they become more specialized, forming different organs and body parts. During the germinal stage, the cells necessary for the placenta, umbilical cord, and amniotic fluid will differentiate to form the embryo. And at the end of the germinal period, the cells that are now called a blastocyst will attach themselves to the mother's uterine wall. And that's essentially the end of the germinal period. So let's review this process of the major developments in the germinal period. These are the beginning moments of the story of conception to birth. We have the female body in the ovary releasing an egg or ovulating. We have the sperm meeting the egg somewhere near the ovary in the fallopian tube. And when the sperm and egg meet, they merge their genetic structure and this fertilization process creates a zygote. Around 36 hours after that fertilization and that merging process of sperm and egg, the zygote has its first cell division. And the cell division continues during the travel towards the uterine lining. So it's traveling in the fallopian tube towards the uterus. By day four of the travel, what's happening is the zygote has turned into what we call a blastocyst and the blastocyst is a hollow ball of cells there's essentially imagine like a basketball a basketball is not a solid structure it has air on the inside the blastocyst is the same it's a structure and a hollow ball of cells that blastocyst is going to travel towards the uterus and hopefully around day six or seven, it's going to initially attach to the wall of the uterus. Around that same time, that hollow ball of cells, the blastocyst, is going to start differentiating. It's going to start doing and having different layers. Those differentiating layers are going to indicate different parts of the body and what it's going to do. This is going to be skin. This is going to be circulatory system. This is going to be this. So even that early on, the cells start to differentiate in what they're about to do. Now, around day seven, when the blastocyst attaches to the wall, it still hasn't implanted fully. So implantation means that that blastocyst really, really truly attaches to the uterine lining. So by the end of the germinal period, this blastocyst has attached to the uterine lining and the uterine lining is starting to create support structures like the placenta, the umbilical cord, and essentially the amniotic sac that will become more and more important for the structure and ongoing development of this young life. Now, obviously this process is quite vulnerable. A large number of pregnancy losses occur sometime around the time of implantation or there's some implantation failure. There's something called a chemical pregnancy and a chemical pregnancy is a very early pregnancy loss that occurs shortly after implantation. 
one report has around 50 to 75 percent of all miscarriages happening at this very early around the implantation stage. Chemical pregnancies take place before an ultrasound can detect a fetus, but not too early for a pregnancy test to detect levels of human chorionic gonadotropin. That hormone is the you're pregnant or you're not pregnant early detection pregnancy tests. Now that chemical pregnancy is different than a miscarriage. They're both pregnancy losses, but they take place at a different time in the prenatal process. A pregnancy that ends on its own within the first 20 weeks of gestation is called a miscarriage. Studies reveal that anywhere from 10% to 25% of all clinically recognized pregnancies end in miscarriage. Now, chemical pregnancies account for, like I mentioned, 50 to 75% of all miscarriages, but they are very early on in the process, that is, before five weeks, essentially very early. Most miscarriages occur within the first 13 weeks of pregnancy. During the first trimester, the most common cause of miscarriage is chromosomal abnormality, meaning that something is not right with the chromosome's combination. Most of those abnormalities are due to a damaged egg or sperm cell. There's something wrong in the meiosis process. But another option could be that there is a problem with the cell division of the zygote. Women under the age of 35 years old have about a 15% chance of miscarriage. Women who are 35 to 45 years old have around a 20 to 35 chance of miscarriage. And women over 45 can have an up to 50% chance of miscarriage. A woman that's had a previous miscarriage has a 25% chance of having another miscarriage. The risk of miscarriage increases as the age goes up from 25 to 35, from 35 to 45. So there's more risk of miscarriage in the older age brackets. So to review, in the germinal period, we have fertilization, cell division, initial cell division, and in a pregnancy that will continue, we have the attachment of the blastocyst to the uterine wall. The woman's body will start sending a coursing level of hormones throughout the body to create the placenta and the structure that's going to support the umbilical cord and amniotic fluid and amniotic sac to ready and prepare the uterus to create an environment where it's going to expand and be able to house this new developing life and to do many different things within the woman's body as well to allow her in her hips and her hip flexors and her ligaments to be more and more ready to be able to deliver the baby. That's all going to actually start quite early on and it's going to do that by way of hormones or chemical messengers. In the next stage of prenatal development, we have the embryonic period. And this period occurs from week two to about week eight after conception. The embryonic stage lasts from implantation, which is around two weeks, until around week eight of the pregnancy. As we know from the germinal period, that zygote divides for about seven to ten days, and it travels down the fallopian tube and implants itself in the lining of the uterus. Upon implantation, the blastocyst is now going to be called an embryo. Now blood vessels are going to start to grow, which is going to form the placenta. The placenta is the structure that's connected to the uterus that provides nourishment and oxygen from the woman's body to the developing embryo through the umbilical cord. That fertilized egg actually releases hormones and instructions for the development of the amnion and the umbilical cord. It's not the mother's body that initiates that. It's actually the fertilized egg and sperm, the zygote. Now that umbilical cord is going to have two arteries and one vein that connect the baby to the placenta. So that's essentially baby to placenta and the placenta is the mom's blood supply, oxygen supply. And this is how the baby is going to eat and how the baby is going to breathe. Very small molecules from the mother's blood 
oxygen, water, salt, and nutrients, they're going to pass to the baby. And the CO2 and waste from the baby are going to go to the mom for the mom to expel and excrete. That placental wall allows pretty small molecules to go back and forth. And this means that nutrients and flavors and things that the mother ingests go to the baby. This includes things like substances and drugs and even hormones that are coursing through the mother's body. So if the mother is really, really stressed and she has adrenaline and cortisol just coursing through her body in the connection between baby and mom, that cortisol can reach the baby and actually stress out the baby too. So stress hormones, drugs, and things that the mother is taking in, either by way of ingesting them or by way of experiencing them in her body by stress or by environment, they can reach the baby and have an influence on the prenatal development of the baby. During the first week of this period, of the embryonic period, that embryonic disc separates into three different layers. It's differentiating, essentially the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. The ectoderm is a layer that's going to become the nervous system and outer skin layers. The mesoderm is going to become the circulatory system, skeleton muscles, reproductive system. And the endoderm is going to become the respiratory system and part of the digestive system, as well as the urinary tract. So even very early on in the embryonic period, we're seeing cell differentiation. And that rate of differentiation is increasing. We're also seeing the support structures, the placenta, the amniotic fluid, the amnion, the umbilical cord, developing to support the embryo. And we're also seeing organogenesis or the process of organ formation in this first two month period time of prenatal development. So the first part of the embryo to develop is the neural tube and you can see it in this picture on this slide. That's gonna become the spinal cord in the brain. As the nervous system starts to develop, the tiny heart will start to pump blood and other parts of the body, such as the digestive tract and the backbone, they'll start to emerge. In the second half of the embryonic period, the growth, it intensifies. The cell differentiation and the cell division, the growth is rapid. The eyes, ears, nose, and jaw start to develop. The heart develops its chambers and the intestines start to grow. So it's important to note that after implantation, and especially in the embryonic period, this period is very fragile as well because it is now baby and mom connected. So what mom does, what mom takes into her system, what mom experiences has an impact, a direct impact on the developing embryo. And researchers are very interested in understanding teratogens or the influence of the factors that a mom takes into her system or that are around her system that can alter or negatively impact the course of prenatal development. We'll talk about that a little bit later in this chapter. Okay, so the remainder of prenatal development occurs in our next stage, which is the fetal stage. And this stage lasts from around two months in to until birth in typical pregnancies. And birth is somewhere around 38, 39, or 40 weeks. When the organism is around nine weeks old, the embryo is now called a fetus. At this stage, the fetus is about the size of a kidney bean and begins to take on recognizable form. Between 9 to 12 weeks, the reflexes will start to appear and the arm and legs will start to move, although most women will fill them a little bit later in development, a little after 12 weeks. During this same time, the sex organs will begin to differentiate, and around 16 weeks, you'll have fingers and toes fully developed, and even fingerprints visible. By 20 weeks, hearing begins. By 24 weeks, the lungs begin to develop. 
By 28 weeks, the brain continues and is rapidly, rapidly growing. By 32 weeks, the bones are fully developed. By 36 weeks, the muscles are fully developed. And 40 weeks is considered full term. Throughout the fetal stage, the brain continues to grow in development, nearly doubling in size from week 16 to 28. Brain growth during this period allows the fetus to develop new behaviors. That cortex in the brain develops and grows larger, and the fetus will spend more time awake. The fetus will move more in the womb and show more motor coordination, which indicates more neural connections in the brain. So by 28 weeks, the thalamus in the brain starts to form and those connections are active. And those connections have to do with the sensory relay stations or sensory input. This means that around 28 weeks, the fetus can distinguish between voices. It can remember songs and certain sounds and it has essentially sensory inputs coming in. If a doctor shines a light on a womb, a baby will move away from the light or take their hands and cover their face to shield themselves from the bright light. Now the fetal period of prenatal development is rich in its connections and its growth. Especially rich has to do with the brain development that's happening. There are a hundred billion neurons in your brain and all of the basic setup of those neurons is available in the prenatal time. What happens over time in the prenatal brain development are specializations of those neurons and connections between those neurons. As I mentioned in week 28, when that thalamic area in the brain starts coming online, that sensory relay station is able to take in environment from the sensory receptors and process it. So even around week 28, the brain is having a sensation of the world and womb around it. In regard to brain development, a few highlights have to do with the neural tube. That tube forms 18 to 24 days after conception from the ectoderm, and it is the beginning of the brain and spinal cord. We also know that neurogenesis means that neurogenesis, meaning neurons being created from the fifth week and on those neuron cells are differentiating and dividing and increasing. Also there's neural migration, meaning that from the sixth week on the levels and structures and regions that will become different regions in the brain start to migrate to the area where they will be and neural connectivity, meaning from the 23rd week on, and even postnatal, even after birth, you are continually having your neurons connect and wire with one another, make new connections. So the longest period of prenatal development is this fetal period lasting around seven months. And the growth and development during this time are dramatic and amazing. Such that by the tail end of prenatal development here, right before delivery, the average U.S. baby is somewhere around seven and a half pounds and 20 inches long. Now it's important to note that these three stages, germinal, embryonic, and fetal, they're not the same thing as the trimesters. The trimesters obviously have some highlights and these trimesters allow moms to be and their partners to understand more about where they're at. Oftentimes you'll hear that people have somewhat rough first trimesters with a lot of morning sickness and a lot of, a lot of physical symptoms, but the different trimesters are different in their experience as the baby grows bigger and bigger. Um, the baby is going to press down on the bladder. So oftentimes pregnant moms have to go to the bathroom frequently later on in development. As the baby gets larger and larger, the diaphragm and underneath, underneath the ribs are going to be pressed up on, which is going to make breathing more and more difficult. 
And also as the baby presses down and smushes some of the organs and the organs have to move sort of out of the way, some pregnant moms will suffer constipation or sort of changes in digestion as a lot of the organs are in slightly different places than they were before. Around week 24 to 25 is something called the age of viability. And that is the age at which a fetus can survive outside of the womb. That is really early, as you can imagine. The lungs are still very weak at 24 to 25 weeks old. They haven't developed fully. So often a child that is not delivered to full term or close to full term will need some help with respiration and need some help with the developing lungs. And even a baby that's full term, you have to understand that a full term baby has gone through breathing by way of the umbilical cord and the oxygen that's in the mother's blood to now being in an outside world and having to inflate those lungs for the first time. So it's a really amazingly different process than what they have been doing. So you'll often hear sometimes that moms are like, my baby, oh my gosh, they breathe, they breathe kind of weird and, and they do actually. So you'll often with parent educators or prenatal classes, they'll often tell moms and their partners, hey, when you deliver the baby, the baby will in breathing take a while for it to be rhythmic. It will at first be a little interrupted and a little labored and it'll be a little concerning at first, but that's normal. That breathing process sounds, sounds a little congested, sounds a little interrupted as a baby is getting into the rhythm of breathing in oxygen in a different way than it had been in the womb. Actually inflating these lungs and not just receiving oxygen by way of the mother's blood. So all in all, it's important to note, why do we want to know a little bit about the stages of prenatal development, we want to know about them because the more we know about them, the less scary that they can be. And a process that has knowledge to it means that we can take care of that process with prudence and wisdom and insight. So whether or not we're pregnant or we are a partner to someone that's pregnant or we are a caregiver or a support system for a pregnant mom, the more we know, the better the process can be. Now, the body is well equipped, powerfully and well equipped biologically for this process. Many structures in the female's body are ready and primed to do this very well. I think sometimes media representations of delivery and pregnancies tend to make them worse or scarier than they actually on average are. But knowing more about the process means that we're not determining our experience based on what a movie says, but we are well read about what the process actually is like. And the process actually, you guys, is not as scary and awful as you think it's going to be. And a lot of moms-to-be need to hear that because they might have heard from their female friends or from their mom about these horror stories of how painful it was and how terrible it was. But the truth of the matter is, is that the process is different for everybody. We have different hips and different ligaments and different perceptions of pain. So someone else's experience does not have to be ours. The process is unique to us and unique to our bodies. And our bodies are well made for this task, this task of development and this task of delivery. We're going to turn to that delivery information a little bit later, but I just want to prime you by saying, don't be scared. We just learn more and it becomes a little less scary. Your book talks a little bit about different prenatal tests that might happen throughout prenatal development. Around seven weeks into pregnancy, that's still in the embryonic stage, you can do an ultrasound. And the ultrasound has virtually no risk to the developing embryo. A little bit later in the fetal period, between weeks 10 to 12, they can screen for genetic or chromosomal defects with a procedure called chorionic villus sampling. They take a little bit of those structures out. as a small amount of the placenta that's tested. Amniocentesis, 
which is taking a sample of the amniotic fluid. That's the fluid that the developing fetus is floating in. Um, that has a small risk of miscarriage, but that can be done a little bit later in pregnancy. That's week 15 through week 18. Also, there's something called a triple screen, which is a maternal blood screening that's done around week 16, 17, or 18. And that can also screen for potential birth defects or chromosomal abnormalities. Oftentimes, you would do the triple screen first to see if there's any risks. And if there are some concerns, you would go to the other prenatal screening methods to confirm or look further into those issues, potential issues. Chorionic villus sampling and ultrasound can help detect and determine fetal sex. That's usually sometimes around week 12, but you can find out as early as seven weeks into pregnancy. And also we know that new technology like functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, can even be done on fetuses to get fetal fMRI scans, which are live pictures of what's going on for the fetus in the developing womb as it's developing. It can be very useful to diagnose potential malformations or see certain concerns. Sometimes a concern might be seen and be able to be fixed in utero, which is amazing. And again, like many of the methods, if you see a concern with one method, you might need more detail with another method. So maybe an ultrasound shows something that's concerning, but we need to get a more detailed picture. So the detailed picture could be the fMRI. There would be a more detailed picture of what's going on later in the pregnancy if you were doing a fetal fMRI. But it's just astonishing how many insights are developing in this research over time with prenatal tests and prenatal screenings. I asked my mom right before I was going to record this lecture. So yesterday she was over at my house and we were talking a little bit about her pregnancy with me. So I was born in 1980 in Santa Ana. My family lived right by South Coast Plaza. And when I was born, they didn't have these prenatal screenings. My parents didn't know what gender I was going to be. That wasn't something that was routinely done or done well or done without risk. So my parents, upon delivery, um, didn't know if they were going to have a baby girl or a baby boy. So they just painted painted the baby room yellow and sort of went for it, right? So I think it's interesting to note that not that long ago, these fetal screening techniques were not in place. So pregnant moms right now have a lot of different options for assessing their pregnancy and the health of their pregnancy and the health of their developing baby, whereas other generations didn't have that. All right, before we switch gears into labor and delivery, we want to talk some more about prenatal development and healthy prenatal development. The reason that we talk about screenings, the reason that we're talking about the process of the germinal, embryonic, and fetal periods is we want to know when systems develop and how, hopefully, we can keep those systems developing in a healthy way as a mother progresses through pregnancy. Some hazards to prenatal development involve a topic called teratogens. And a teratogen is any agent that can potentially cause a birth defect or otherwise negatively alter the cognitive or behavioral outcomes for a child. Now, there are some relationships here between a teratogen and its impact. There's a dose relationship, there's a genetic relationship or a genotype relationship between mom and child, and there's also a timing or a time of exposure relationship in regard to the impact of a teratogen on the developing fetus. During each prenatal stage, environmental factors affect the development of the fetus. The developing fetus is completely dependent on the mother for life. It's important that the mother receives prenatal care, which is routine medical scheduled care 
during pregnancy that monitors the health of both the mother and the fetus. From what we know already in the germinal period, when the zygote attaches to the wall of the uterus, the placenta starts to form, and that placenta provides nourishment and oxygen to the fetus. Most everything the mother ingests, including food, liquid, prescription and non-prescription drugs, travels through the placenta to the fetus. Therefore, anything the mother is exposed to in the environment can affect the fetus. If the mother is exposed to something harmful or teratinogenic, the pregnancy could end in miscarriage or that child could have lifelong effects postnatally. Again, a teratogen is any environmental substance or agent, biological, chemical, or physical, that can have a detrimental effect on the developing fetus. Exposure to teratogens during the prenatal stage can significantly raise the risk of birth defects. As I mentioned before, several factors influence the amount of damage that a teratogen can have, including dose or level of exposure, heredity, and any other negative influences, for example, the combined effect of several teratogens. There are several known teratogens that expectant mothers are advised to avoid during pregnancy, including alcohol, prescription and or illegal drugs, and tobacco. So we have a discussion of psychoactive drugs. And psychoactive drugs are called that because they alter the state of consciousness of the mother. So as listed on this slide, you'll see caffeine, alcohol, nicotine, cocaine, meth, marijuana, and heroin. For caffeine, the FDA recommends none or only very sparingly taken in. Caffeine is a stimulus, so it alters consciousness by way of increasing the central nervous system response, and that could be damaging to a developing fetus. So the FDA recommends either taking in none, no caffeine, or only very, very sparingly small amounts. We want to talk about alcohol as well, because alcohol has devastating effects on the developing fetus. Alcohol use during pregnancy is the leading preventable cause of mental disabilities in children in the United States. Excessive maternal drinking while pregnant can cause fetal alcohol syndrome disorders. It ranges in severity from minor to very major. It is unknown exactly how much alcohol is necessary to cause such damage, so doctors typically recommend that alcohol should be avoided during pregnancy. Based on studies conducted on animals with um, animal models of experimentation, it has been suggested that a mother's alcohol consumption during pregnancy can predispose her child to like and favor alcohol later. Each organ of the fetus, as we know from a previous slide, develops during a specific period in the pregnancy process. Research has demonstrated that the time during which a developing fetus is exposed to alcohol can dramatically affect the appearance of facial characteristics associated with fetal alcohol syndrome. Specifically, the research suggests that alcohol exposure that is limited to day 19 or 20 of gestation can lead to significant facial abnormalities in the offspring of primates. Research into fetal alcohol syndrome has demonstrated that the time at which the alcohol is given can negatively impact the system that's developing at the time of that exposure. So different regions of the brain that show sensitive growth periods at certain times, they're the most susceptible to teratinogenic effects of alcohol during the time at which they're coming online or developing. Obviously higher doses have a higher negative effect, but timing also matters. And also what matters is that oftentimes alcohol is one of many substances that have teratinogenic effects on the fetus. So oftentimes a person that is drinking alcohol might also be smoking or taking some other drugs. 
And the impact of all those things together can be quite negative on the developing fetus. It's for those complicated reasons of dose, timing, and interaction with other teratogens or other, other drugs or other influences. It's for that reason that the U.S. recommends no alcohol. It just says none. Don't do it. Part of the reason that that recommendation is so strict is that oftentimes when you tell people, hey, don't do something, they often do it a little bit, right? So if you were to tell a mom, yeah, you know, you can drink once in a while, very small amounts, that often would mean that people would drink more than they said they would because people often underreport those sort of behaviors. So part of the reason behind the recommendation is that since we don't know the dose, since we don't know the timing, and since we don't know whether the mom is taking in other substances that have teratinogenic effects, it is the best practice and the safest practice to tell a pregnant mom, listen, don't drink. Take that off the list of things that are coming into your system. So goes your system, so goes the baby's system. And alcohol is a depressant, so it slows down the baby's development. Smoking tobacco is also considered a tratogen because nicotine travels through the placenta to the fetus as well. So when the mother smokes, the developing baby experiences a reduction in blood oxygen levels. According to the CDC, smoking while pregnant can result in premature birth, low birth weight, stillbirth, and sudden infant death syndrome. Other issues that can be caused by prenatal exposure to smoking are inattentiveness, muscle tension, colic, and other potential negative impacts. The more that a mother smokes or is exposed to even secondhand smoke, the greater the risk for those things. Now you have to remember that this is smoking directly, smoking by way of secondhand smoke or someone in the house smoking, and also e-cigarettes or vaping. Those things also have negative teratinogenic effects. And that goes for marijuana too, whether marijuana is ingested or smoked. Marijuana's use during pregnancy can be harmful to a baby's health because the chemicals in marijuana, the THC, they pass through the mom system to the baby and can harm or depress the baby's development. Some of those health problems include lower birth weight, more time in the NICU, a higher likelihood of stillbirth, some demonstration of lower intelligence later, and a higher possibility of smoking weed at age 14. It should be noted, of course, that the use of any type of drug, whether illegal, prescription, or over-the-counter, can be dangerous during pregnancy. But illegal drugs, such as heroin, cocaine, and methamphetamine, they are tremendously damaging for the developing fetus. Babies can be born addicted to those drugs, and they're more likely to be born prematurely have low birth weight, and experience a lot of physical defects or problems. Many of them end up with attention problems and some internalizing and externalizing behavior problems later in life as well. In this story, heroin is especially damaging. There are some special considerations of withdrawal for babies that are exposed to heroin. I, as a social worker, have worked with babies that have been born with drugs in their system and watching them withdraw from the drugs because the drugs are still in their system, watching them in agony, it hurts them after birth to have to withdraw from the drug. It's a really, really awful, awful thing to experience and to have to parent through and protect through. So truth of the matter those drugs, those are all big no-nos. They're extremely damaging to both mom and baby and have tremendous, tremendous negative effects. Now, there are other teratogens that affect prenatal development. It's not just drugs and alcohol. There are things like radiation, pollution, and infectious disease. 
radiation from like x-rays increases the risk of childhood cancer as well as emotional and behavioral disorders in the children later on. That's why it's recommended for pregnant ladies not to receive x-rays unless they're like absolutely necessary and even then with a lead apron over to protect the developing fetus. And there's other environmental factors like unsafe environments, pollution, smog, chemicals, poor water quality, or things that are in the environment that could be a hazard to prenatal development. And also maternal diseases could either be communicated via the placenta from mom to baby, or receiving that disease during the birthing process. So if we know a little bit about what the mom has in a disease sense, we can potentially make some better determinations about medications to give the mom or delivery practices that keep the baby safer. For example, if we know that the mom has genital herpes, we would want to deliver through C-section and not through the birth canal because delivery through the birth canal is going to expose that baby to the herpes virus, to that, to that disease. And that can be very, very fatal and very negative for a potential life to come. Some other factors that are influential to prenatal development have to do with the mom's diet, nutrition, her obesity or not, her age, her vitamin levels, including folic acid B complex, which is a very necessary prenatal vitamin, the amount of stress that she's under, that the mom's under. You know, maternal stress can be teratinogenic it can absolutely negatively influence prenatal development and even have impacts on that child's development moving forward in their life, including cognitive problems, ADHD, a higher infant mortality, and a lower birth weight. And the dad in this scenario can have factors that influence prenatal development as well. Radiation that's exposed to the dad or the dad being around some hazards environmental hazards could potentially alter his sperm cells or have chromosomal abnormalities or deficiencies or defects on the sperm cells. And when those defected sperm cells combine with the mom's egg, there could be the course of prenatal development hindered on account of paternal factors. Now a dad that smokes or a dad that's older or a dad that is stressing out the mom or sort of has a relationship with the mom that's very stressful, those factors can also negatively impact the developing prenatal environment. And I think it's important to note here that this is why it's so important for moms and partners to receive good prenatal care and parenting classes or prenatal classes ahead of delivery. Any form of prenatal stress felt by the mother can have negative effects on various aspects of fetal development and can cause harm to both the mother and the child. When a mother is under stress, physiological changes occur in the body that could harm the developing fetus. Additionally, a stressed mother is more likely to engage in behaviors that could negatively affect the fetus, such as smoking, taking drugs, or drinking. And for all of these reasons, it's really important that we develop and understand prenatal care. And this is where I want to turn now. So let's talk a little bit about prenatal care. Prenatal care is awesome. High quality prenatal care allows a pregnancy and a delivery to be so much better than it could be without. And that's why it's so important for pregnant moms and their partners to know what services are available? What prenatal services are available? What can I learn? What can I be assessed on? What support can I receive? Because the developing child and the life that we're about to parent later on really can benefit from these services. Definitionally, prenatal care usually means routine medical care visits for a pregnant mom. These visits include screening for manageable conditions like gestational diabetes and also treatable diseases that can affect the baby or mother. 
along with prenatal care, there would be the availability of comprehensive educational, social, nutritional services that help the mom be a healthy mom. As part of prenatal care, prenatal classes are very useful to a mom and a partner understanding, number one, what's going on during pregnancy and what is normal and what is maybe not normal. What should I be worried about? What should I not be worried about? But also, what does labor and delivery look like? What does it feel like? What should I expect? And also, what should I expect after or postnatally, after I deliver? What are some things that we need to start developing so that our family moving forward can be healthy and whole and safe? Okay, so we want to talk a little bit about birth and the postpartum process. Essentially, I want to talk here about labor and delivery. So as part of a comprehensive team of educational, social, nutritional, and medical support, a pregnant mom might have a midwife, a doctor, and a doula. They might even have a prenatal class person, somebody that gives them the prenatal class information. And all of those people are part of a birthing team. So let's talk a little bit about the childbirth setting, the setup, and the attendance. So these people are part of a birthing team, and the birthing team varies across cultures. Who's in the room and what they're doing and how they're doing it look different in different cultures. Now there's two types of helpers. These aren't the doctors delivering the babies. These are the helpers to the delivery. You've probably heard of a midwife or a doula. Now midwives and doulas, they do similar things, but they have different training. A midwife has medical training and graduate study in nursing essentially. Whereas a doula is a caregiver that is giving physical, emotional, and educational support for the mother before, during, and after childbirth. They give delivery support, but they also give support throughout the process. A doula is not medically trained as a nurse. They're trained as a parent educator and a labor and delivery educator. So they're trained up essentially on pregnancy, labor, and delivery. Now, in our context, most U.S. births are born in a hospital setting with doctors and nursing staff. But other cultures in other countries have a lot of home births where they use midwives and doulas. But home births can be particularly easy or more satisfying, especially for low-risk pregnancies or for a mom that has had delivered before and is on her second or third or fourth child. The research shows that those can be more peaceful and more satisfying for delivering moms. Research has also shown that the actual labor and delivery process, whether it's a really hard delivery process or a very easy and quick process, those birth experiences, those labor and delivery experiences, are not correlated with happiness or satisfaction later. But having a supportive partner during the birthing and delivery process, it does positively impact satisfaction later in life. So as part of the birthing team, having a good team and good support is actually very useful for later happiness and satisfaction. I think that's one of the reasons that prenatal care and prenatal classes are so important. And they're important not just for pregnant moms, they're important for the people in and around a pregnant mom's life that are gonna be part of this life to come. So this is dads and best friends and and moms and grandmas and grandpas and, and aunts and uncles, people knowing about healthy prenatal development and knowing about prenatal care and knowing about labor and delivery and knowing about parenting, those things allow us all to do a better job for the generations underneath us. And they deserve it, right? We deserve to give them a good shot at being a generation that's well supported. 
Okay, so let's talk a little bit about labor and delivery. Something that I think is so important to remember is that every pregnancy feels a little different for each woman. And the reason for that is that we're different. We are biologically different. One of the things that makes delivery feel different for different moms is that we have different pelvises and hip types and bone structures. We might all have the same sort of general layout of the hips, but the size of the hips and the size of the pelvis, there are different pelvis types, at least four different pelvis types which will impact how the baby exits out of the birth canal and how it feels during the exit. Most people have a pelvis type that has the baby doing a three-point turn when, they're, when the baby is being delivered. So that three-point turn or that three, three-step process is one, the baby's head goes down towards the cervix. Then its head turns backwards facing for most people facing the floor, facing down at the ground. And in the last, after the head is out, then the shoulders have to turn to get out. So sort of head down, head back, and shoulder turn. That's how most deliveries take place. But different pelvis size, shapes, and ligaments are going to make that process potentially feel different for different delivering moms. Most babies are delivered in that way that I just talked about, sort of a three-point turn, head down, head back, and then after the head is out, the shoulder turns to scooch the shoulders out. Now, the pelvis during pregnancy is flexible. It's way more flexible than normal. And the reason for that are the pregnancy hormones, including estrogen. Why is the pelvis more and more flexible throughout pregnancy and especially into late pregnancy? Well, that pelvis pretty soon has to get a baby out. So that pelvis needs to be flexible. It needs to be able to open. It needs to be able to deliver the baby. Part of the reason that women experience labor very differently. You'll hear of one mom that was like, it was no big deal. It wasn't painful at all. It was, I don't know what the big deal was. And then you'll hear these stories of women that said it was the most awful and most traumatic and most, most painful thing they've ever experienced. You'll certainly see different women with different stories of how painful or not painful it was for them. And the reason for that is that not only do we have different pelvis types, but we also have different ligaments and nerves. So you have nerves in your mouth for your teeth. And if you and I both got some dental work done, we would experience the dental work differently. With same dental work, same procedure, but we would have different opinions of what it felt like because we have different nerves and different sensations and different sensitivities, right? So this is especially true during labor and delivery because those ligaments and the experience of birth feels different depending on the type of ligaments that are predominant for a woman during her delivery. And those ligaments and nerves are all throughout the delivery process. They're in the upper leg, they're in the back, they're in the vaginal opening, they're in the birth canal. You have nerves all the way down there and different ligament types are going to have different sensations for different moms. And when you combine that with different psychological readiness and different hip types and different pelvis types and different birthing support services, it makes sense that delivery would be different for different moms. So whether biologically a mom has ligaments that are shaped like spaghetti noodles, so they're nerves and they're bundles of axons put together that send electrochemical impulses, whether those nerve types are like spaghetti noodles, um, round and sort of put together, or whether they're flattened out like fettuccine, the different ligament types that a woman has in her body and the different constellation of ligaments down in that area pre-delivery will have different sensations of pain. Therefore, the delivery process can feel different from woman to woman. One of the cool things about delivery is that 
what happens is your uterus becomes a home for your baby throughout prenatal development. Before pregnancy, the uterus is like an upside down pear. It's about 2.75 inches high and about two inches across. But that uterus over the length of pregnancy can grow to around 12 inches high, around the size of a watermelon by the time of full term. And the uterus is made up of layers and layers of specialized muscles. At the top right side of the uterus, there's certain cells. They're called pacemaker cells. And those cells are specialized. And they're specialized for something called polarity. And polarity has to do with a push and pull rhythm. This is the rhythm that's going to push and pull and get the baby towards the outside of the world, right? So the push pull and that rhythmic muscle movement allows for the baby to move down and get ready to be delivered. Now the muscles in your uterus, this is so amazing. They are responsive and more able to function in that push pull way in darker, calmer environments. The reason for that is darker and calmer environments often facilitate oxytocin release. And oxytocin is a pregnancy hormone and a hormone that enables uterine contractions, especially these special types of contractions, which prepare the uterus to get the baby in position for delivery. And as I mentioned before, the plexus or the areas where your nerves are, which are the lower legs, the lower back, the lower uterus, and sort of down the legs and around the lower back in this entire birthing area, those nerves are different in their sensation for different women. So the delivery process does indeed feel different across women. And often within the same woman, the first delivery, the first labor and delivery often take longer and are somewhat more difficult physiologically than the later pregnancies. This makes sense because the muscles by that time of second and third birth, the body is more adjusted. It has already done it. It has already accommodated for a delivery before. So not only psychologically, but physically, the later births are often easier and quicker. Not always, but often. Okay, so you have your baby in the uterus. We have the placenta, and from the placenta, the umbilical cord is attached to the baby, and the baby is getting ready for delivery. Well, at the bottom of the uterus, in between the uterus and the vagina, or the birth canal, is something called the cervix. And the cervix is essentially, it functions to protect the baby from the outside world. Uterus, cervix, vaginal opening. Now, pre-pregnancy, the cervix usually feels like the end of your nose. You know, press, your, press the end of your nose for me really quick. You feel that cartilage, you kind of feel that rigidity. Pre-pregnancy, the cervix is hard, somewhat hard like that. But at pregnancy, it softens and starts softening where it feels more and more like your lip. The softening of the cervix is good for delivery preparation because we need, by delivery time, the cervix to basically get out of the way. It's done its job. It will flatten and get out of the way so that the baby can come out through the birth canal, come out through the vagina. Now, normally the vaginal opening is straight, but during pregnancy, especially during labor, there are these things called rugae, and these are folds of muscles that allow the vagina to spread out, kind of open up like an accordion. It'll stretch out. So you might have asked yourself, how in the world does a baby go through that area? Well, it goes through that area because there is a temporary adaptation in the vaginal muscles. And that is on account of these rugae. They have the ability to expand that area much larger than it normally would be. 
And after delivery, it will go back to its normal size and straightening. So before we move forward into the birthing process, I want to talk a little bit more about the cervix. So the cervix, you know, you have your uterus, cervix, and then the vaginal opening. Well, the cervix includes something called the mucus plug. It's, it's full of cervical mucus. And this is just meant to protect the baby and the uterine environment and the amniotic environment from the outside world, from contagions, from infections, from things that are in the outside world. Most people lose this mucus plug gradually over the last few weeks of pregnancy. There's something that they also call the bloody show, and that is a big part or a bigger part of the mucus plug coming out one to three days before labor. And you've often probably heard of water breaking, and that has to do with the leakage of amniotic fluid, usually uh, one to two days before the baby is born. So that early labor, the mucus plug breaking down, potentially it coming out entirely, the water breaking, that can take place over, over time in the last part of pregnancy. As those things take place, the labor and delivery process will move forward. So in early labor, that cervix is going to start to dilate. It needs to essentially thin out. So we talked about it thinning out. It's called effacement. So that cervix is going to go from essentially kind of like a doorknob to a mushroom, to a thick pancake, to a paper thin cervix, and then it's going to move out of the way to allow the baby to come out of the birth canal. When the contractions actually start is kind of where your textbook picks up. Those contractions usually are 15 to 20 minutes apart. They're about one minute each contraction. And over time, the contractions get closer and closer and the intensity increases. So you have closer contractions, stronger contractions, and the cervix dilating to around four centimeters or so. By the time that the uterine contractions are starting at about 15 to 20 minutes apart to the end of first stage is somewhere between six to 12 hours. So this first stage, according to your textbook, really sort of starts when those contractions are consistently at the 15 to 20 minute apart length. But you also know that early labor can take days. It can take days and days to get to the spot where those contractions are that regular. In the second stage, which we call active labor, essentially what's happening is the cervix continues to dilate somewhere between four to 10 centimeters, like it continues to expand. That's so that the head can come down, down into the birthing canal, right? Down into that area. For our understanding, this stage of labor is probably what you associate when you think of labor. You see this in the movies. This is where push, push. This is where the contractions are getting intense and pretty close to one another in time. And this is where we have our memories of watching, watching movies where people were delivering, usually in this second stage. First time mothers often take about 90 minutes at this stage. Once they're in really active labor, that's where the contractions are pretty much every minute and they last for about a minute and they're pretty intense. So first time moms usually take about an hour and a half and second time mothers that have been through this process before are sometimes around 45 minutes, maybe around one hour. Now, if you do an epidural at this stage of delivery, it will add time to your second stage. An epidural adds around an hour to active labor. So although you might be numb, it's going to slow down the birthing process. So let's talk a little bit more about this active labor second stage. 
because this is essentially where the baby gets delivered. Many women get into this second stage and as the contractions increase and increase, and they will, they will absolutely get more intense. Some women don't know, oh my gosh, how much more do I have left? In active labor, when a mom gets towards seven or eight centimeters, the labor can be a very hard moment for moms, especially first time moms. And at that seven to eight centimeter time is often where most women request epidurals because the, the pain is, is quite considerable and the contractions are quite considerable often for some women at that point. What I think is important to note is that if you are seven and eight centimeters dilated, for most women, you're only a couple hours out from being fully dilated and fully ready to deliver. So it's important for a woman to know if they're gonna say yes to an epidural, they need to know what the pros and cons of it are. So the pros and cons are essentially this. Many women do epidurals. There's no shame in that game. Every woman has a different experience of childbirth and women need to make decisions based on what they're able to bear and what their biology and their psychology can handle. The thing about it though is, is that epidurals do have side effects. So with an epidural, you're going to need a catheter and oftentimes post epidural, post delivery, moms will have a tremendous spinal headache. And this is a severe, severe, severe type of migraine headache. And that can last for about a week after delivery. The epidural also slows down the labor and delivery process. So some women have expressed that if they would have known that they were so close to the end, they really wish and regret having done the epidural because it, it gave them that huge headache. The week after delivery, they had that tremendous pain for a week and they were trying to connect with their baby and they had that catheter and they had some side effects and they expressed that if they would have known really that they were just at the tail end they probably wouldn't have done it again if they, if they knew. But you can say that after when things are all calm, but in the moment of delivery and in the moment of the birthing process, you know, a mom and a birthing team, they're just making the best decisions they can for the situation at hand. So there's no shame. There's no shame in that. It's just something to consider that, that epidurals do have some side effects and if you're having a pretty good delivery and feel like you can, you can get through it, it might be to your benefit to just allow the labor to continue and finish off naturally. So in the second stage, in the very final moments of the second stage, the most intense part where we're saying push, push, in that moment, in those places, this is the last part of labor right before the baby is outside of the womb. So the head is down because the cervix is out of the way. It's fully effaced. It's moved out of the way. It's flattened and then moved out of the way. The head is down. And if a mom can push normally and breathe normally through the pushes, the baby will have a better oxygen level. Now, when you hold your breath during pushing, the baby is also essentially holding its breath by way of not getting oxygen. So this is why they prepare mom with breathing exercises to breathe through the pain and to not hold their breath and not, not to have mama hold her breath during the pushes. Because if a mom holds her breath during the pushes, then the baby gets deoxygenated or a lower oxygen level. And we don't want that. We want the baby to be able to have a good normal amount of oxygen that it's receiving because the baby's brain and baby's body need oxygen. Now doulas will often tell you that in this active part of labor where the labor is very intense, it's important to not just be laying on your back the whole time, that that's actually not a very conducive labor position, that you should be changing positions and, and moving so that the amniotic fluid moves around a little bit and that the baby also knows, hey, it's time to, 
it's time to be moving out of this birth canal here. And also for pain relief too. Different positions are going to be important to allow the mom to bear up underneath the extreme contractions. Now, because most women's tailbone has a tilt up at the very edge of that tailbone, what this means is that the baby's head will often have to ramp up and sort of exit. It has to sort of, it has to angle up in order to get out of the vaginal opening. This sometimes means that in these last pushes of the baby about to be delivered, sometimes the head will come out a little bit, but then go back in when the contraction ends. That's actually quite normal. So they'll tell delivering moms and especially their birthing partners or the people that are going to be in the room with them, hey, that's normal for the head to sort of exit a little bit and then go back in. Don't be scared about that that that's normal, that's the head getting ready to come out. Now that head getting ready to come out is quite a process because a baby's skull is not fused together yet. There are fontanelles, there are soft spots, there are bones that jut out that can create almost like a cone shape that allow the baby to get out of that smaller space. So those bones will actually fold or jut out in their skull, allowing them to get out of the birthing canal and vagina. But you can imagine that many birth partners and people that are coaching in the room that don't know that that is something that happens, it could be really scary to see that the baby's head is misshapen. Well, that's normal and it will go away. It'll, it'll get better. It looks really scary at the time, but it doesn't stay that way. Now, as the baby's head comes out, it puts a lot of pressure on the perineum. Now, the perineum is the area between the vaginal opening and the anus. It stretches considerably, and often at this time, without an epidural, it will be burning and definitely, definitely burning quite a bit at this stage of delivery. If the baby is having trouble getting the head out and we're having trouble delivering at this spot, the perineum can tear, which will create more room to be able to get the baby out. Or sometimes surgically, they will cut a episiotomy. They'll actually cut that piece of skin in order to have more room for the baby's head to come out. The baby will often, after the head is out, need to sort of tuck and turn its shoulders and in that last push before being fully, fully out. So once the head is out, the shoulders should be close behind. And once the baby is completely out of the body, uh, that is the end of the second birth stage. Now research shows that if we can keep that umbilical cord connected as long as possible, it's really good for blood flow and blood volume for the baby. That umbilical cord allows the baby an easier process of breathing in the new world. That blood volume being higher allows better ability for their lungs to start to expand to now receiving oxygen in, in the outside setting versus within the womb. And at this point, some moms and dads or moms and partners might be concerned about the umbilical cord being wrapped around the neck. But in practice, that umbilical cord is easy to sort of slip over the baby's face and sort of get out of the way. That umbilical cord is providing oxygen for the baby. And what the research shows is that if we cut the cord too quick, we're sort of doing a really quick drop in blood volume and blood pressure for the baby. So if we can keep the umbilical cord attached after delivery, after the baby is out and now being held by the mom on her, on her chest, that we should only be cutting the cord after the cord is stopped pulsating with blood. After that has done and all the blood volume has sort of done what it needs to do, then we should cut the cord. That gives the baby the best chance of really good respiration. And finally, after the baby is born, hooray, we have the third stage, which is the afterbirth being delivered. 
the placenta, the umbilical cord, and some other membranes will be detached and expelled. This usually happens around eight minutes after delivery. It's usually all out by the second wave of contractions because contractions continue for some time to get the afterbirth out. So that third stage at this point really only takes a couple minutes and is relatively, relatively quick to experience. So everything I've just said, you guys, walks you through some prenatal information. This is what a mom that is doing prepared childbirth would learn. She would learn about breathing techniques. She'd learn about the process of labor and delivery. And she'd understand her anatomy and physiology to be able to prepare mentally for a childbirth process, the natural process of going through stage one, two, and three. Now, it's important to remember that a C-section or a cesarean delivery happens when a mother is either in distress during labor or even the baby might be in distress during labor. So I was born by C-section. My mom had mentioned that they had kept pushing and pushing and pushing for a really long time without any success for me. And what happened is my lungs, they were so fatigued from all the pushing and the lack of delivery that my lungs deflated. They actually collapsed. So because my lungs were in total distress and I was deoxygenated, they had to quickly get my mom into surgery, into having a C-section, to have me come out as quickly as possible. And I spent my first week of life in an incubator because not only were my lungs deflated, but I was premature by about three weeks of my due date. So my lungs needed the help. So every labor and delivery has its differences. What I hope that I've provided for you guys is some idea of the varieties of experiences that women can have. And knowledge is power here. When we know more about the process, we understand and can prepare for the process in different ways. Since we've talked about childbirth and the labor and delivery process, I think it's very safe to say that this process is quite extensive for the baby as well as for the mom. As the mom goes through stressful contractions and heavy breathing and holding her breath and things hurt so bad, so goes the mom, so goes the experience of the baby as well. So when mom holds her breath, the baby is not getting that oxygen, right? So that birthing process, especially if it's very difficult, could be considerable stress on the baby as well. If the delivery takes too long, like it happened to me when I was a newborn, the baby can develop anoxia, which is a condition in which the fetus or newborn has an insufficient supply of oxygen. And if that happens long enough, insufficient oxygen can cause brain damage. So we don't want moms to just be in labor for 72 hours, grunting in pain, holding their breath. That's not good for mom, and it's certainly not good for the baby. So it's important for moms to have a good idea of what labor and delivery will be like so that they also have birth partners or helpers or family members that are part of that birth plan too, so we can stay on track, that they're part of a prenatal or a birthing team that knows what's going to be best for mom and baby in the unique experience of their labor and delivery. And to also know the limits of where, where it's acceptable to keep pushing and where we might need to find another way for this baby to come join us. When might it be time to consider a C-section, for example? Or when or how far into pain would a mom have to say yes or no to the epidural? Having those decisions and thoughts ahead of time is a better way to prepare for labor and delivery rather than it being a total surprise when the time comes. Right after delivery, we have our newborn baby assessed by nurses and doctors on something called the APGAR scale. This assessment takes place quickly at minute one and five of birth 
and evaluates heart rate, respiratory effort, muscle tone, reflex irritability, and body color. Higher scores obviously are involved with better healthiness. And the reason for this is very low scores on the APGAR scale show a lower survivability and more distress. So those babies need more interventions and more help. In regard to postnatal bonding, we know that there is a period of time right after birth where it's cool to have the formation of a connection, especially a physical connection between parents and the newborn. Now, if the baby has to be taken away and, and dealt with medically or something like that, it's not going to disrupt bonding. Bonding can still take place. So for most moms, what would be very useful is to hold the baby skin to skin, have the lights be a little lower, have the environment get calm and quiet, lower that cortisol and the stress hormone release between mom and baby. Maybe the baby might feed or breastfeed at this time. Some do, but some don't. And basically get some connection time, some bonding time. We often tell new moms that the skin to skin contact is so, so good between caregiver and baby. And this is something that we'll talk about in a later chapter two, which is a foundational concept called attachment. We remind moms in this postnatal time that breastfeeding or bottle feeding are a choice that they're going to make. Breastfeeding is best, but breastfeeding can be somewhat difficult for some moms. It takes practice. It's not something that is just totally easy for everybody. The latching process and how it works and when to sense and where to hold the baby and how to hold the breast and how to get in position, those things take a little bit of time. And they take a little bit of time because really anything does. You know, when you learned to swim or you learned to pirouette or you learned to do a cartwheel, you didn't just do it automatically. It took a little bit of a process first. And breastfeeding is the same way. For moms and babies, it involves a little bit of practice first. We remember postnatally that the baby's head shape might be misshapen because of the fontanelles and those, those bones in the skull. We know that there might be some bruising or some patches of skin that look concerning. Some babies have somewhat blue fingers or toes that goes away after a few days. Oftentimes babies breathing is somewhat irregular as they're adjusting to breathing oxygen in the outside world format. And even slight heart murmurs are somewhat common for newborns as even their heart gets used to pumping blood and blood volume and blood pressure and being in the outside world. Postnatally, the umbilical cord that has been cut um, will have some part still attached to the newborn, which will fall off. Usually it'll dry out and fall off within a couple of days. The genitals of babies are often somewhat swollen, especially babies that are born breech. So they've been born essentially butt first. That'll go down within a couple of days. And babies are going to need to feed a lot and very frequently. And so new moms are often told, hey, don't be surprised by that. Their stomach is very, very small. So they need small amounts very, very frequently, especially in those first few days. So you keep your energy up, you keep your fluids up, you keep your water drinking up, you keep resting and keep feeding because the baby needs to feed very regularly. And in regard to the mom's adjustment, we know that the mom also goes through some postnatal or postpartum adjustments. We call the postpartum period the period after childbirth or delivery that lasts for about six weeks or until the mother's body has returned to a nearly pre-pregnant state. And this involves physical, emotional, social, relational, familial, and psychological adjustments. In regard to physical adjustments, the mom's uterus is going to go from this very large state, inflated state, back down. It's going to contract down. It'll be slightly bigger than it was pre-pregnancy, but it will contract back down. 
Oftentimes, mothers will continue to bleed for quite some time after. There will be some spotting and some bleeding as the hormones stabilize and the body stabilizes. Especially right after delivery, it's important for a mom to urinate frequently and to not overdo physical activity because that uterus really does need to, to heal and contract. If you let your bladder expand too much and you don't urinate, you hold your urine, you are not allowing that uterus to kind of go back into position. If you also do a lot of heavy lifting or you're lifting or doing physical activity that's very jarring, you're also not allowing that uterus to go back into position. And that can be harmful for you because the uterus needs to contract. It needs to go back to its normal size. And the only way it does that is if you rest a little bit, if you chill out a little bit. So they tell new moms, listen, don't push it. Just keep your fluids up. Keep going to the bathroom. You're going to have to go to the bathroom quite a bit. Keep going to the bathroom. Rest as much as you can. Have other people help you out. Let your body heal. There will be some heavy bleeding in the first week or so, some clots. And there will be some spotting over the first few weeks postnatally and postpartum. Three days after the delivery can be especially emotionally hard because there's some considerable hormone changes in hormone levels. But if those emotional changes remain by week two, three, and four, the new mom should definitely be assessed for postpartum depression or symptoms of depression. I read a study that said 8% of women after having a baby will end up having some thyroid issues, some, some thyroid level issues which can look a lot like depression. So a mom should also be screened for some other conditions that might be going on as well. But as there's such a huge adjustment, it's important to, with new moms, talk openly about how they're feeling and how they're doing and to be screening and being aware of postpartum depression. That's a lot to go through. Pregnancy is powerful and purposeful and amazing but it's very physically and psychologically demanding as well. So resourcing moms and supporting moms and being part of a team for a mom means that we're also being very mindful of how she's doing emotionally as she's in this journey to being a brand new parent. Well, you guys, I'm so proud of you. I am so passionate about this lecture. I know this lecture probably ran a little long because I just love it so much. I hope that you've really enjoyed this lecture. I hope you've learned something valuable about pregnancy, labor, and delivery. I'm looking forward so much in our next chapter to talk to you about physical and cognitive development in these newborn days of infant development. As always, if you have any questions, about class material, class expectation, class content, please email me or reach out to me. If you haven't decided yet what paper to write, or if you're going to do the first paper in this class, start thinking and researching and making those decisions now. It'll make your life a lot easier. And otherwise, I just want to tell you, I am so proud of you. You did a great job today. I hope that the rest of your week is totally awesome. Congratulations on finishing chapter two, you guys. Good job, everybody. I'll catch you next week.